Jesus loveth this, O oh my soul, O oh my soul. What wondrous love is this, O oh my soul? What wondrous love is this that caused the Lord of bliss to lay aside his crown for my soul? For my soul to lay aside its crown for my soul. To God and to the Lamb I will sing, I will sing. To God and to the Lamb I will sing. To the Lamb, who is the great I am, while millions join the theme, I will sing, I will sing. While millions join the theme, I will sing. And when from death I'm free, Good morning and welcome to Worship with Binghamton United Presbyterian Church. It is good to be together as the people of God and we hope that in this time of worship you find your hearts touched and your spirits moved by Christ's presence among us. It is the fourth Sunday in Lent and we have a special guest preacher this morning. The Reverend Pat Robb is the person that introduced me to the Unraveled series and she wrote a sermon about one piece of When Life Comes Unraveled that was not in the um, original package, and so I asked her if she would come and share that with us. If you do not have a worship guide and you are coming to us by phone, give us a call in the office and we will make sure you have one in time for next week's worship. And be sure to join us this afternoon for our walk at 2 o'clock where we are gathering to experience God in nature in one of the national and one of the natural parks in our area. Let us worship God. Please join me in the responsive call to worship. Gracious God, we bring you the broken parts of ourselves. Hem us in before and behind. Creator God, we bring you the joyful parts of ourselves. Weave us together in hope and praise. God of new life, we bring you doubt and faith knotted up in our hearts. Unravel our doubt. Weave faith into our hearts. Draw us together and point us towards you. In hope, in faith we pray. In hope, in faith we worship. Amen. Our song of gathering this morning is Love Divine, All Loves Excelling. We'll sing four verses and the words can be found in your worship guide or on your screen.
Let us pray together our prayer for wholeness. Dear healer of every heart, we seek wisdom, power, and strength to endure and return to whatever you have planned for our birth, life, and death. May we live as those who seek forgiveness in every breath, struggling against quick fixes or fleeting pleasures in favor of the joy that comes of knowing that you love us deeply. Amen. Assurance of God's grace. Beloved, God does not abandon us to the systems that destroy. God does not bind us to our regrets. For whoever holds us to what we once believed, God says, come and follow. No forgiveness and sin no more. Love abounds and justice shall manifest. Whatever new life is desired, may the peace of Christ be welcomed among us. Thanks be to God who leads us to new life. The psalm of the day is Psalm 42. As a deer longs for flowing streams, so my soul longs for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and behold the face of God? My tears have been my food day and night, while people say to me continually, Where is your God? These things I remember as I pour out my soul. How I went with the throng and led them in the procession to the house of God with glad shouts and songs of thanksgiving, a multitude-keeping festival. Why are you cast down, O my soul, and why are you disquieted within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him, my help and my God. My soul is cast down within me. Therefore, I remember you from the land of Jordan and of Hermon and from Mount Mizar. Deep calls to the deep at the thunder of your cataracts. All of your waves and your billows have gone over me. By day, the Lord commands his steadfast love, and at night, his song is with me a prayer to the God of my life. I say to God, why have you forgotten me? Why must I walk about mournfully because the enemy oppresses me? As with a deadly wound in my body, my adversaries taunt me, while they say to me continually, where is your God? Why are you cast down, O my soul? And why are you disquieted within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him, my help and my God. Good morning. It's time for the time for the young at heart. And today I thought we would talk about Bibles. We always talk about the Bible um, in church and we read from the Bible, but if you don't know what the Bible is and how it works, it can be kind of confusing because there's lots of different kinds of Bibles. There's this one that's like what we have in the pews at church. And there's this one, which is like the story Bible we gave you that had pictures and stories from the Bible in ways that are easy to understand. And there's one like this. I'll have to get real close with that to show you. It's got two kinds of languages in it. It's got Greek and it's got English. And that is because most of the New Testament was written in Greek and then translated later into English. And we have the Bible that has both languages in us to help us understand better about what we're reading and the translation that's in there. And there's a little fat one that looks like this, and there's another big one that looks like this that has lots of commentaries in it. And there's all kinds of Bibles. And if you think of the Bible as a book, you'll be confused a lot. 
because the Bible is actually a whole library of books. Um, think of the word bibliography, or think of the word in Spanish, biblioteca. That means collection of books. And these books are all different kinds of literature trying to understand the relationship between God and people that go back almost 4,000 years. And so some of the stuff is so different from how we live now that it's hard to understand. And some of the stuff sounds like it could have been written last week. And part of what we do as Christians is to try our best to understand as much of the story of God's people and the story of who God is acting in history as we can. And there's a sort of a game that some people play that say, if you were going to sum up the whole message of the Bible, what would it be? And there's actually a story like that in the Gospels, in the stories about Jesus, where somebody says to Jesus, what's the most important part of the Bible? And Jesus says this, love God with your whole heart and your neighbor as yourself. And all of those stories and all of the rules that are in there and the letters that are written and the poems and the songs and even the novels are all about the different ways that people have tried to love God more than anything and to love each other as much as we love ourselves. And so if you remember one thing, from the Bible, remember that. Love God with your whole heart and your neighbor as yourself. And that'll tell you everything you need to know. Let's pray. Dear God, we thank you for stories. And we thank you for the Bible that tells us the stories of your love and about how we are learning to love. Help us to read and to understand and to love you with our whole heart and our neighbors as ourselves. Amen. And now, it is my great honor to introduce our guest preacher for this morning, my friend Pat Robb, who many of you know in many different stories. Pat has been a pastor in Susquehanna Valley Presbytery since 2003, and she likes to remind people that she grew up on the Monopoly Board in the seashore community of Ventnor, New Jersey. She is the proud parent of young adults Ned and Joan, and happily partnered with Sherry Eaton, and she has been the very happy pastor of the other UPC, Union Presbyterian Church of Endicott, since 2007. Welcome, Pat. A reading from the book of Revelation, beginning at chapter 6, verse 1. Then I saw the Lamb open one of the seven seals, and I heard one of the four living creatures call out, as with a voice of thunder, Come! I looked, and there was a white horse. Its rider had a bow, a crown was given to him, and he came out conquering, and to conquer. When he opened the second seal, I heard the second living creature call out, Come! And out came another horse bright red. Its rider was permitted to take peace from the earth so that people would slaughter one another, and he was given a great sword. When he opened the third seal, I heard the third living creature call out, Come! I looked, and there was a black horse. Its rider held a pair of scales in his hand, and I heard what seemed to be a voice in the midst of the four living creatures saying, 
a quart of wheat for a day's pay, and three quarts of barley for a day's pay, but do not damage the olive oil and the wine. When he opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature call out, Come. I looked, and there was a pale green horse. Its rider's name was Death, and Hades followed with him. They were given authority over a fourth of the earth to kill with sword, famine, and pestilence, and by the wild animals of the earth. Holy Wisdom, Holy Word, thanks be to God. There are two approaches you can take to the book of Revelation. You can read it as a prophetic word based on events that have already taken place, or you can read it as a prophetic word based on events that have not happened yet. Prophecy, after all, is not fortune-telling. Prophecy is truth-telling, and that cuts both ways. Understanding the past and seeing what's coming based on the events we see right now. The choice you make, whether you choose to believe it, it's about the past or the future, determines whether you see it as a book of comfort or a book of fear. I believe the visions of Revelation are based on past events, and I believe the book was written to bring comfort and hope. It was most likely written after the siege of Jerusalem, during which the Imperial Roman army seized the city and destroyed both city and temple. The book describes the sorrow and loss resulting from the destruction of the place most holy to Jews. The siege of Jerusalem was horrible. The Roman army was fierce and brutal, and blood flowed in the streets. Revelation and apocalypse mean the same thing, uncovering, revealing. The vision of the four horsemen reveals the brutality that was ready to blanket the world in death and destruction. In modern terms, the four horsemen of the apocalypse have shown up in all kinds of places. Shortly before Christmas in 1996, I saw this tabloid while standing in the checkout line at Wegmans, and I knew it was a keeper. Tabloids generally are on the side of scaring you to death. They've shown up elsewhere, though, and I find this appearance fascinating and helpful. They've shown up in the work of clinical psychologist John Gottman, an expert in human relationships, especially intimate ones. Gottman has something he calls the love lab. It's basically an apartment. Couples who are struggling with their relationships stay in the lab for 48 to 72 hours, and all their conversations are recorded. By the end of their stay, Gottman can predict with something like 98% accuracy whether their marriage will make it or whether their relationship is unraveling. He predicts this based on the presence or absence of four dynamics in their interactions. He calls these the four horsemen of the apocalypse of relationships. The four horsemen are always a sign of death, destruction. Their appearance in communication reveals a brokenness that can lead to the death of the relationship. They are criticism, contempt, defensiveness, and stonewalling. The first horseman is criticism. Criticism isn't the same as offering a critique or complaining about something that has upset you. In those instances, you're talking about behaviors. But when you criticize, you're talking about the person. You always and you never are frequently found in criticism, a signal that you're telling the person that you've given up on them, that you've boiled them down to this behavior. If you find you're criticizing someone you care about, don't panic, it happens. But when it becomes your main mode of communication, that's when it should sound an alarm. The second horseman is contempt. 
Contempt is communication that is mean. It can include eye-rolling, mockery, name-calling. When you communicate with contempt, you make the other person feel worthless. And get this, couples who communicate with contempt have more colds and flu than those who don't. This stuff's bad for your health. And if we're talking about couples, contempt is Gottman's single greatest predictor of divorce. The third horseman is defensiveness. Now, when I first learned about these behaviors years ago, I could only ever remember three out of the four. Finally, I realized I was forgetting the one I am most often guilty of. Defensiveness is often a response to criticism, even perceived criticism. I've been defensive in situations in which I'm pretty sure the person wasn't criticizing me at all. Anyway, defensiveness only escalates conflict. It doesn't help to move through it because it's a way to blame the other person for whatever you are unhappy about. And the fourth horseman is stonewalling. On Gottman's website, it's described this way. Stonewalling is usually a response to contempt. Stonewalling occurs when the listener withdraws from the interaction shuts down, and simply stops responding. Rather than confronting the issues, people who stonewall can make evasive maneuvers, such as tuning out, turning away, acting busy, or engaging in obsessive or distracting behaviors. When you're stonewalling, you're flooded with negative emotion, and it paralyzes your ability to respond at all. So you just go away. And though Gottman identifies these behaviors as being problematic in marriages and intimate partnerships, they're deadly to friendships, too, and relationships between colleagues, between members of organizations, between members of faith communities. Any situation that depends on healthy communication undertaken with goodwill. So... The four horsemen show up in all kinds of places, as I've mentioned. But all is not lost. Relationships can begin to unravel, but there are tools we can use to weave them back together again. Scripture offers some particularly strong tools. In his letter to the Corinthians, Paul reminds us that above all, love is patient and love is kind. Gottman offers some tools that are found under the umbrella of patience and kindness. Criticism stings and bites, but gently expressing our feelings can open a conversation. Contempt degrades and undermines our connection, but making a sincere effort to notice and affirm the things we appreciate about the other person builds up a connection and strengthens it. Defensiveness bites back, but finding the patience and goodwill within us to take responsibility for our shortcomings enables us to grow and mature. Stonewalling requires a different approach. It's a response to feeling emotionally overwhelmed. That's a physiological response. It's happening in our bodies, and it requires physiological first aid. Gottman discovered this in the famous love lab by interrupting couples about 15 minutes into intense fighting by claiming the recording equipment was malfunctioning and needed to be adjusted. The couples were told not to discuss their issues, but to simply sit and read magazines until they could roll cameras again. When they resumed, their heart rates had lowered, they were calmer, and they were able to talk about their issues more positively. When you feel yourself stonewalling, the best intervention is to take a break and do something soothing and pleasant for a little while. And there's another tool, but it's not in the Gottman playbook. It's found in our playbook. How many times, Peter asks Jesus, ought we to forgive one another? Seven times? Jesus' response is shocking. Seventy-seven, he says. Seventy times seven. In other words, don't keep score. Forgive. 
forgive one another. I do want to clarify, situations of abuse are different. This is not your pastor telling you to forgive ongoing mental, spiritual, or physical abuse. Don't use Jesus' words to stop you from getting the help you need to protect yourself. Get help. Let me help you to get help. Sometimes it does seem like everything is unraveling at home, on the news. The losses pile up and our grief has nowhere to go. A prime time for communication to be more challenging than ever. But we can still choose to engage one another, spouses, parents, children, co-workers, strangers online, with patience and kindness. We can choose not to let these particular four horsemen ride roughshod over the precious connections we have with one another. We can choose patience and kindness and forgiveness. We must. Thanks be to God. Amen. Our song of response is God, When Human Bonds Are Broken. We'll sing five verses and the words can be found in your worship guide or on your screen. Let us say what we believe using the words on your screen or in your worship guide. I believe in God, the great weaver, who weaves us together in community, collecting our loose ends and turning them into belonging. I believe in the Holy Spirit, who hems us in before and behind, catching us when we fall and writing us into God's holy narrative. And I believe in Jesus Christ, who loved and claimed the people society had thrown out, refusing to write off anyone as scrap. I believe God has woven part of God's self into the fiber of our being, making us inherently worthy of love and belonging. I believe the fabric, fabric of my life is weak, that I am prone to error and need God's handiwork to remind me of love. I believe in the church and that like a quilt of different fabrics, she is designed to be as diverse and as beautiful as God's creation. And I believe that when life unravels, God is there to stitch my wounds together, 
to hold me in the palm of God's hand, to tell me of love, and to invite me into a new journey. Amen. During Lent, we invite you to support the missions of PCUSA through One Great Hour of Sharing. One Great Hour of Sharing is the single largest way Presbyterians join together to share God's love. Three impactful programs, Presbyterian Disaster Assistance, Presbyterian Hunger Program, and the Self-Development of People Program, um, are supported with our One Great Hour of Sharing offering. Presbyterian Disaster Assistance is the Emergency and Refugee Program of PCUSA. It supports the easing of poverty through grants to vulnerable populations dealing with natural and human-caused disasters, including currently COVID-19. It works to end systemic racism with grants to communities of color and refugees. It promotes congregational vitality with support for volunteers and spiritual and emotional care for pastors, including those help, helping to respond to COVID-19. You may make your one great hour of sharing anytime through Easter. And now, let us take time to consider all that God has done for us and to reflect on what we can give of ourselves from our time, talent, and treasure. If you would like to make a monetary offering today, you can go to the web address that will be on your screen or click the link in the YouTube video description, or you can send a check in the mail. During Lent, we also support PCUSA One Great Hour of Sharing offering which is used to support Presbyterian Disaster Assistance, the, the Presbyterian Hunger Program, and Self-Development of People. You can designate a gift to this offering using the memo line or by donating online at the web address listed on the screen and in the YouTube description. And if you aren't in a position right now to make a financial offering, reflect on the other ways that you can, respend, that you can respond to God's goodness using your time and your talent. Because God has been so good to us, let us return our tithes and our offering.
Join me now in our prayer of dedication, which is on your screen or in your worship guide. Let us pray. Loving God, open our hearts to a new world, a world where there is no longer least and greatest, rich and poor, a world where there is enough for all, and all are treated as beloved children of God. <clears throat> Until that day comes, bless our small contributions of time, talent, and treasures, and may they work toward the building of your new world. Amen. <clears throat> what shall we pray about today? I've actually got a pretty long list today. And the first list is for healing. We pray for Dan, who is recovering from heart surgery, for Holly, who has a broken kneecap and torn hip muscles, um, for John Krumenek and her partner, who are battling COVID and the 400 in COVID quarantine on the BU campus, for all of the doctors and nurses and care providers who are trying to get this under control so that we can go back to living more uh, with more personal connection. For Muriel, who is still in rehab at uh, the Hilltop Center, and um, for all those who are recovering, Lord, in your loving kindness, hear our prayers. We are incredibly grateful that John and Erica are going to move forward with the wedding that was canceled um, last year because of the pandemic. They will be um, making their vows in the presence of their family on April 10th, and we celebrate with the whole Hunt family and with Erica's family as they reach this new milestone. Lord, in your loving kindness, hear our prayers. We are grateful for so many things, for Sherry and the kitchen crew and all that they do to make sure that hungry people are fed, for Anne's safe move to Good Shepherd Fairview, and for all of those who have been vaccinated or are going to be vaccinated soon, for the warmth of the weather, and for all of the good things that surround us and fill our lives that we sometimes lose sight of because it's so complicated. Lord, in your loving kindness, hear our prayers. And of course, as we do every week, we are praying for Tina and her mother in this difficult time, for all families who are struggling with problems that seem too big for them to solve, for the world, for an end to violence and that peace and stability and hope may be the things that guide us in the future. Lord, in your loving kindness, hear our prayers. What would we do without sun and earth and air and water? Praise you, Creator, who set them into life and introduced them to each other. For the air has warmed up enough for us to feel more comfortable when we're out in it. The ice is melting down to pavement. And the spring is starting to show signs that it will come again. It doesn't have to happen right now, and I know it won't. I just have to know that it will eventually. So thank you, creator of all. Meanwhile, there is a mess unfolding in people's lives. People of color and white women are carrying the heaviest loads of parenting and job loss, of propping up what will not last, and stretching hope for others when they no longer have any for themselves. The endless workarounds for asserted unearned privileges and punishing inequities no longer work around so much of this, the right now urgency of what to do next to manage creator of every living thing, if we are all looking at what must never be again, and we are its beams and spanners, bring down the mighty and all we imagine about ourselves, scatter pride and exalt lowliness before all to save all, grant this remaining mercy without words to hold up a light so that others find a dark patch of promise under whatever is hard and cold. And now, with the confidence of the children of God, we pray together the prayer that Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. 
Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever. Amen. Our song ascending is Healer of Our Every Ill. We'll sing the refrain and four verses, and the words can be found in your worship guide or on your screen. In the midst of sorrow, may you find comfort. In the midst of darkness, may you see light. In the midst of despair, may you know hope. In the midst of death, may you find life. In the midst of questions, may you be held in the embrace of the one who answers. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion and fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you this day and forever. Amen. Peace be with you.